sort of work. And there's a glass of water over there. Be Lovely. Thank you, Jack. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome. To explain the context uh, for those who don't understand why I should be stood here discussing Dundee when Jack mentions our work in Ayrshire and Renfrewshire is because uh, one of our company's offices is over in Ayrshire, and the other is here in Dundee. So we are uh, two bases, one of which is in this fine city. And we, in fact, provide uh, curatorial advice into Dundee City Council, uh, which explains why I thought it would be lovely to take this opportunity to touch upon uh, what's been happening in this region. And in, when I talk about region, I'm very much thinking of the sort of Tay Plan uh, strategic development area, which encompasses a lot of Perth and Kinross, which Davy Strachan and his team uh, take care of, Angus, where Bruce Mann from Aberdeenshire takes uh, a watchful eye on what happens there, and Fife, of course, with Douglas Spears uh, uh, very much in charge of that area when it comes to supporting the planning authority. So I've usurped uh, uh, my neighbours to suggest what's happening and the broad themes that are coming forward in this area. And when we're looking at this area in terms of research, archaeological research, which I always think is a quite an amusing phrase because I really struggle to think of any archaeology that's not research-driven at some level, so really we're talking about archaeology, we can't escape the core issue of 2008. Uh, for those of you who didn't notice, there was a wee downturn in the economy in 2008. This is significant for archaeology because the consequence was the collapse of housing and other development activities. Uh, why does that bear on archaeology? For those not familiar or appreciating, it's very much because at that time, underpinned by planning advice note 42, Archaeology is a material consideration in the planning process. If you look to secure uh, entitlement to change land use, if you uh, uh, apply for permission, every planning authority needs to consider what archaeological consequences there are to that and require appropriate works where necessary. So no development means a huge fall off in the amount of archaeological research we're doing. And that is a really important and severe thing. It doesn't stop... Uh, the amount of development-led archaeology uh, undertaken, though, it just massively reduces it. So this is the Dundee Leisure Pool site, which was evaluated by Alder during this period of recession. It's a good example of what happened, where the focus in development terms changed from one of uh, universal commercial development, residential expansion, into the main developers really going forward were utility companies, and they were the state, be it in that local or central government. So Dundee Ledger Pool, here you see older excavating uh, an intrusive trench to sample the area of the development, and then they moved on to open area excavation, going through a series of medieval and post-medieval structures. And one of the more intriguing discoveries was they got a volume of uh, industrial sherds from 17th century sugar refining from the Dundee Sugar House, which was a very interesting and unexpected assemblage they recovered from that, though nearby was the Sugar House wind, which would have given us a clue, but that, that material had migrated onto this site was quite uh, unexpected. And the works rolled on then into monitoring during the construction of the pool, the digging out of the basins for the pools. And there again, they got a very nice range of medieval pottery going back to the 12th century. And also they got a nice look at the 16th century shoreline, which is such a big issue in Dundee that we have progressively edged into the Tay, taking the dry land with us. Uh, we've not leapt into the water. There are other sites coming forward that have rolled, yes, that would be a lovely idea. I'm not sure I have the power of control over the lights, but I shall encourage anybody who does. I think we've been abandoned. Well, any, anybody who has a, a shotgun license uh, in the audience, uh, uh, feel free. I mean, we can survive the lead shot coming back down. Uh, so, that would be good, now that that's caught, caught in a podcast, me advocating shooting lights out. Uh, I, I'm sure that verges on a terrorist in encouragement. So, uh, then looking more broadly, up at uh, Picaro Cemetery, this is another site that came forward during this period of suppressed activity. Uh, there again, 
more of a greenfield site rather than an urban site, evaluated by guards. So guard archaeology cut a series of trenches over the core cemetery area, not discovering very much, uh, which was a bit of a disappointment, but that, that's why we do these exercises. But the reason uh, Alder ended up up the hill doing work was, again, because there were superficial works. There was uh, pathways being put in out with the core area that was evaluated, and these bumped into a kissed cemetery. Ooh. It's an eclipse. This bumped into a kissed cemetery, which was a very nice long kissed cemetery, and uh, older were able to sample one of those kists and recovered a very nice date from the mid-6th to mid-7th century AD, suggesting an early Christian Pactish burial there clustered around a prehistoric mound, or what's inferred to be a prehistoric burial mound. And so that was a lovely chance to step into uh, uh, the early Christian era for Dundee. But even more nicely, because it was just for pathwork, in conjunction with Dundee City Council, Alder arranged for a new capstone to be sourced and to be laid over the kist, preserving this site in situ. So we have a cemetery next to a cemetery next to a cemetery. If you move from prehistory through early Christian to current usage of this site. Some would argue they didn't need to apply for a change of land use in planning sense because there is no change of land use. But we achieved that preservation in situ, the underlying drive of archaeology management in the planning process. We're only looking to disturb and lose these valuable assets when we really need to. But this apparent run of activity masked what uh, is in fact a tragedy, which is the absence of my next slide down here, uh, which is a tragedy, which is what happened to our profession in this period. Profiling the profession is a uh, multiple period review undertaken by Landward Research uh, on behalf of the main heritage agencies in the UK. And it reviews the level of employment. And they captured those figures in 2007-8 and just there in 2012-13. And it shows a horrific tale, a 30% loss in archaeological employment. That's 30% of the archaeologists employed in 27-8 no longer work in our profession. Now, they've probably left our profession, never to return. It's almost like a generational loss, what has happened. And it's happened across all spectrum. The early strongest losses were in the commercial units as the halt of development happened. Uh, but that spread with the austerity measures in the public purse. When you look at the breakdown between the percentages, between the different aspects of who employs archaeologists, it goes across all of them. And the public purse's contraction has led to losses on the historic environment services. It is a tragedy what has happened. The only sector that's survived to some escape to some extent, and increased its percentage, is education and academic research. But I would deeply suspect that is more to do with the lag time of the consequences of the contraction of the public purse, and they will tragically catch up with the rest of us. So this has left us in a rather skipping forward mire. Uh, and that mire is the loss of archaeologists, the disadvantage that's created for our discipline, the, the loss of headway. So what what happened during the recession that enables me now in 2014 to have a title about an archaeological renaissance? What is it that has fundamentally shifted us so that I'm not just talking today about, isn't it nice we're starting to get back to a bit of vibrancy in our economy, in our region? And what's changed is changes in the policy and guidelines that underpin what we do here in Scotland. And it's a change that has moved us away from the practice in other portions of the United Kingdom in many senses. At the start of this period, we saw Historic Scotland, in conjunction with the uh, Cabinet Minister, consolidating uh, a number of statements they had into the Scottish Historic Environment Policy, a document they've continued to refine and develop from them. A very high-level strategy document, but it's placing a burden with the with the strength behind it of their cabinet minister about the recognition of the needs and potential of the historic environment to affect all parts of uh, our society and that that responsibility has to be cast down to all sections of government. In turn, that's become the driving force behind a wonderful series that Historic Scotland have produced of detailed guidance, managing change in the historic environment. This is just one of their volumes on setting but they've done a raft of these that really underpin 
uh, the policy structure of SHEP, and I apologize now, the number of acronyms that have been generated from 2008 till now is astonishing. They all have S in it somewhere. Uh, and I'm sure we must run out. I think we're heading for a national shortage of acronyms for use in the heritage sector. Now, these are very strong documents. At the same time in 2010, Scottish planning policy, SPP, was reformed, trimmed down, and again turned into a more readable, pithy, strategic document. It's delivering a more effective integration of the historic environment into planning and development control. Scottish planning policy then, in turn, the, the, the leanness of that fed again down into the fundamental document that drives development-led archaeology, which is the planning advice note, now 20 to 2011, as opposed to the old Pan 42, which you saw earlier. Now, that is a much slimmer document. We've lost uh, national planning guidance as well. And there's a lot of concern when this happened that we'd be losing some of the fundamental building blocks of obliging developers to look at archaeology. But nothing could be more different from that uh, possible truth. This has retained the essence of what's important, recognizing the finite and non-renewable res resource that is archaeology, and advocating its strong protection and investigation and uh, tre good treatment within the planning process. But by creating a leaner, more targeted document, it enables our fellow professionals in other aspects of planning to understand better what we're about and to find ways to draw it in. And this is to the huge benefit of archaeology. Historic Scotland was also, through uh, uh, their good uh, offices, able in 20, 2011 uh, to support the bringing forward of the Historic Environment Amendment Scotland 2011 Act. Uh, uh, pithy in its title, uh, easy to say and remember in meetings. Uh, it's an incredibly important bill because it epitomizes what Scotland has achieved in this period. And this is a gradualist reform within our existing legislative and policy frameworks. A very different approach than that being taken elsewhere in the UK. This bill enhanced the protection for our historic environment, improved enforcement terms, and drew closer together our listed building and scheduled monument systems. But also, it set the framework for bringing in statutory lists of gardens and design landscapes and battlefields. Now, these are, this is a statutory duty on Historic Scotland to compile these. It's not a statutory protection for these sites. So it also epitomizes the nature of where the treatment of the historic environment has moved to. It's about creating partnerships, and these inventory lists are a stimulus for those partnerships to go out and draw together central government, local government, landowners, interested parties to come together, to join together and develop a shared, mutually owned management plan for these nationally important sites and to look for their future, not through top-down diktats, but through a partnership working approach. And this is an incredibly important change that has come during this period. The whole thrust has been this gradualist movement to a large-scale realignment of historic environment, policy and legislation to see the mainstreaming of the recognition of the cross-cutting nature of the resource and the importance of its adoption uh, by every portion of society. It can't be understated what's been achieved in this period to move archaeology from a sort of silo mentality, localised issue, which would be shared by people like us as important to something that fellow professionals in so many areas are thinking about and using. Uh, uh, just one aspect of that is Historic Scotland's review of their archaeology function, where one of their key outcomes was to appoint a head of archaeology strategy, whose role is to develop those partnerships, support and leadership within the archaeological community so that we can achieve more. And part of the realization of that whole movement, I think, is in the wonderful work that was led by the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland in developing SCARF. I think I remember. The Scottish Archaeological Research Framework, another acronym of WONDER. But this, this is development is a wonderful drawing together of a comprehensive research framework that gives us a clearly referable to document that will guide fellow professionals those interested and those commissioning work to understand what we know, what we don't know, and where we need to go in archaeological research. That 
has been a wonderful building block that's been put in place during this period. And SHED, another uh, lovely acronym, you can see how S gets heavily used throughout this, H-E into S. If anybody could draw up a sort of copyrighted list of acronyms and sell them to people, there's good money in it. So SHED is Scotland's Historic Environment Data, and this is a strategy in terms of the dissemination of the information we're gathering in our historic environment records. And archaeology is about information. We can't escape that. We generate new information, new understandings of the past, and we must communicate it and keep that data safe. And that's what SHED is all about. And both of these were launched and supported by Scottish ministers. We're at a point that archaeology is on the forefront of the minds of our politicians. Not always the best thing to say about the forefront of the minds of politicians, but it's a really good thing. It shows where we are. And a good example, uh, I have a slide to start discussing about a champion now, a champion that's not a heritage body, that's taken on board this movement to support the historic environment. I don't really need to, since I appear to be surrounded by Forestry Sc Commission Scotland uh, advertising promos of the good work they're doing. But just step back and realize that this is a body whose primary role is supporting the growing of timber. And they are doing some of the best work now in the historic environment in Scotland. Part of that is driven by documents like this, the UK Forestry Standard Guidelines, which explains and lays down a burden on all foresters in the UK and Scotland to manage woodlands, to forest areas in a responsible way relative to the historic environment. And that's driven the Forestry Commission Scotland to an outpouring of new resources in terms of practice guides and case studies explaining how to achieve this. The forestry industry now is increasingly becoming a big user of archaeological services, like development-led was. We've seen a huge broadening of who is coming to archaeologists as heritage professionals to seek our help and guidance. But the partnership theme is there, which is why my talk is about a renaissance, not just a broadening of the workload for archaeologists. Nice though that is. Uh, and the Renaissance is in work like this. This is a, a survey contract that was undertaken in the National Forest Estate for Forestry Commission Scotland by AOC Archaeology Group. And what they did off their own back, working in partnership with the FCS, is they went out and surveyed Park Newt Four Poster in Perth and Kinross to contextualize the work they were doing in the forestry estate. And that seems a huge benefit of actually stepping back and trying to get added value out of one contract and a contractor going out there and saying our role here is to do more, to give more back and to benefit the entirety of our understanding by doing additional works that balance out in the end to give a much nicer product for our client and a much better understanding of our shared past. Now, development work has started to come back, as you might have got from my theme. Since early 2012, mid-2012, we've seen an upturn in work. Initially, I'd say the strongest focus was on the refurbishment and renewal of existing historic structures. So building recording on this farmstead near Marykirk would be a good example of those early stages of the resurgence, where we're changing use of buildings but retaining them. But increasingly, gap sites are being uh, redeveloped for new housing. Now, archaeological targets, this is a, a World War II uh, airfield air raid shelter in Montrose. It always would have been included in a program of works, so that was very nice to do. But one of the impacts of SCARF can be seen here as well, and that's on the role of contemporary archaeology in recording graffiti and other uh, uh, indicators to show long-term use. Now, however uh, uh, slightly interesting these are, it does show that we've broadened our understanding of what archaeology is. Large-scale urban work is coming back as well. This is uh, an excavation commissioned by Five Council, or Five Cultural Trust, for their new museum and art gallery in Dunfermline, itself a wonderful development within the precinct of Dunfermline Abbey. But even our development work that's coming back is coming back in a very different form and a much uh, a broader approach to inclusivity. Fife Council commissioned this work as a community archaeology project. 
it was looking at delivering works necessary for development, but they did it in a way that involved the community, that drew them in. It became a training, learning, education event. It became a way for the community to take ownership of the site, to discover more about their past, but still deliver a very important piece of development-led archaeology at one side. This is not how we used to do it. There is such a change in what we're doing in terms of communicating archaeology to people and not having hoardings around a site that nobody knows what's happening behind it, but actually trying to open these sites up and bring in the community. The diversification of agriculture is not a new story. Renewable energy, this is uh, work for a couple of turbines going in near Kirimur. This is ongoing uh, across our area, and this gives us the ability to encounter archaeology in our agricultural landscapes which might otherwise not be uh, met and found. And while nothing came of this one, I think it's important to flag up Bankhead of Kinloch, which is an AOC site up in Angus, where uh, work for some agricultural sheds did uncover, expose and enable the investigation of a fascinating range of round and square barrows uh, from the Pictish period, a site that otherwise would have been uh, uh, totally uninvestigated and unappreciated without that prompt and that funding. And together this shows a real change in the volume of work we're doing and the way we're doing it in our region. And really, I think the Renaissance comes from the coupling of so many things. Our changes in policy and framework, these gradualist reforms which enable us to do so much more and to draw in so many other aspects of society. And really, if we're looking at our region, what's coming towards us? This is a very good question. Are we just looking at roughly what happened before in the Tay side, the Tay plan area, or is there a sea change? And I think uh, it's important to look at the main issues report that's been issued by Tay plan just recently, earlier this year. They're looking at a 20-year strategic program for, for our region. What's happening between 2016 and 2036? What are the broad themes? And the broad theme is over 2,000 new homes a year. Now, these are predominantly looking to be focused on the Perth core area and the Dundee core area. And we're seeing this now in Dundee, looking at the planning applications coming through. You can see this pressure for new homes, which need to be delivered to enable our communities to grow, expand, and uh, revive themselves. But that means there's a huge amount of work to come. What you can see on the yellow is, is house completions in the Tay Plan area uh, in the years running up to the crash. Uh, it's not hard to spot where the recession hits. It's where the house completions plummet. And uh, the first blue line is 2012-13. Uh, the second blue line is 2013-14. So that's the year we're in now. We are going to, in two more years, be building more houses in the Tay Plan area than we have built in uh, recent history. This is a huge opportunity for archaeology to look at landscapes, to look at sites, to look at areas within the new environment of policy guidelines of procedure that we now have. We also have coming forward some massive linear projects, the A9 upgrade and dueling, the upgrade to the A92, these linear routes through our landscapes, which give us an opportunity to encounter sites and locations and areas that we're just not used to finding them in, where we don't traditionally look. These will be an amazing opportunity to radically change our history and understanding of the past across our region. But we have that huge opportunity. On the left, you know, we have the opportunity for community archaeology, for greater effort in terms of communicating what we're finding, relaying that. We have the wonderful strategic structure of the research framework. But we have to utilize that, to harness it. And we have that communication vehicle in the shed. In the shed is a strange phrase to say. But on the right, this is the problem we have to face and remember. This is a CITB study of the shortfall in terms of the number of new craftspeople needed for the construction industry. I'll give you a clue. The bigger the number it is, the shorter you are of workers who have the right skills for the construction industry in its resurgent phase. Archaeology is just the same. 
we will find ourselves in 12 to 18 months desperately short of archaeologists. Something that we can't hide from. It's often been said that the original planning guidance issued in 1992 would never have got issued if it hadn't been for the fact we are in a recession. So the minor fact we had next to no archaeologists wasn't a problem for the construction industry. We are facing a major problem in the next year to two years, which is how do we support our societies rebound and reinvigorate themselves after this recession when we have discarded a third of our colleagues? How do we do that? There's no easy answer. The universities won't produce them quick enough. Uh, and even if they do, they're at the start of their professional careers. We've lost people with decades of experience in our profession. How do we get that back? How do we take advantage of this position? I think there's the opportunity for an amazing renaissance in our understanding of the past, in our understanding of how we've lived in this landscape, the achievements we've had throughout prehistory and history. We're on the cusp of amazing transformation, and the only thing that may let us down is the shortage of archaeologists. Thank you.